Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Can um, you please introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, my name is Greer Webb. I'm a sophomore at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm the co-founder of North Carolina Town Hall and Young Americans Protest, which is an organization that gives young people the avenues to get involved with policy and politics. Um, and I've also been active in leading some of the social justice movements in the summer of 2020 after the horrific murder of George Floyd. Um, my name is Dorian Mullenberg. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I attend UNCG and my major is political science with a minor in ADS. Cool, and I'll add my pronouns in there. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm majoring at UNC Chapel Hill in political science and African-American studies. Cool. Where are you from originally? I was born and raised from, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Nice. And so, um, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's where I grew up and that's where I went to school, K-12. Um, most mm -hmm. of my family is from North Carolina, and so I enjoyed growing up in Raleigh. Um, what is your background, and with whom do you identify with? Yeah, so my family background has given me a unique perspective on the world, I like to say. Uh, my mother is white, and my father is African American, and I have two younger siblings. And so growing up and going through those dynamics in elementary school, middle school, high school, trying to really figure out where I fit in and then mm -hmm. ultimately coming to the understanding that I don't have to fit in, uh, that I can be myself and be confident in my skin um, has been very powerful. And so that's kind of how I operate now in college and exploring my interests and my goals and just understanding that I have a rich family background on so many levels. And so that inspires a lot of what I do, um, whether it's getting involved or just meeting people, talking to people and hearing their stories, just understanding that I have a um, unique background that not a lot of Americans have. I try and use that to my advantage. Cool. What What were some of your experiences growing up? Yeah, so my experiences were um, mainly had in predominantly white spaces. And so Raleigh yeah. is a predominantly white city. It's the capital city, of course, of North Carolina. And so while I was growing up, I had a lot of good experiences, and then I had a lot of interesting or different experiences than a lot of people. And so one experience in high school that I talk about a lot is, again, when it comes to fitting in, um, yeah. I just remember going to a basketball game, right? And I had friends in multiple friend groups. And so going to the basketball game and sitting during the first half of the game with um, some of my friends that happened to be white and then switching it yeah. up at halftime and going and sitting with my friends that happened to be Latino or Latina, as well as black and just seeing the looks that I got from people uh, was very interesting um, and, and kind of pushed me, motivated me to really work um, and do some of the things that I do now trying to close the racial gap here or the racial divide in North Carolina and to just understand that, you know, we're all people and that we should celebrate our differences. We shouldn't be blind to them. Um, but experiences like that where I had to operate as a biracial person in either predominantly black or predominantly white spaces has kind of shaped who I am. Um, faith is important to me as well. And so I go to a um, multicultural church with folks of all different backgrounds and all different races. And so it's been interesting and that's shaped my life a lot to be able to see, you know, every Sunday, uh, my pastor being a woman, being an African woman, um, my pastor um, just sharing a message that, you know, again, we can celebrate our differences and we can celebrate in having the same faith. Um, but it's really up to us to make a difference in the world. And so experiences like that, you know, just being really close with my family and hearing that family history have all shaped me to the person I am today. Um, I have a um, question about your story. Um, when you say like the looks you were getting from people, were it, were it, was it people as in like your friends, your friend groups or like pizza, people um, outside of the friend group? Yeah, that's a great question. So many of the looks were from some of my friends, you know, of, mm. of different races. Um, and mm -hmm. then some of them were from people that I wouldn't really call my friends, but just people mm -hmm. that I knew at the school that were trying to figure out, you know, why would I move or how could I go so easily between two friend groups? And so to mm -hmm. understand that because of my background and because of the lessons that my parents and my pastor had taught me, um, I was able to do that so easily and not give it a second thought um, to some people that just wasn't natural to them. And so to deal with the looks and again, to build that confidence in high school and who I am today to say, you know, I don't really care if they're looking funny or looking sideways at me. Um, I'm going to continue to operate and move the way that I know is right. Um, it is interesting. So yeah, it was looked from a lot of people, sometimes my friends, and I would have to follow up and have conversations with them, white and mm -hmm. black, and say, you know, this is just how it's going to be. I don't 
want to um, position myself to think one way or to act one way um, when I enjoy being around all of y'all. And then some of the looks were from people on the outside and mm -hmm. I don't really talk to them anymore, but mm -hmm. I think it's just interesting uh, the ways that people were brought up and we don't have the same mm -hmm. upbringings and the same backgrounds and, and people are really um, taught. I really think it's a taught trait to not like other folks. And so it was, you know, sad, but again, it motivates me to do what I did today. Right. So during that time, did you think the way you do now or um, did something change along the way? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that something changed. And so mm -hmm. I was all, I, like I said, at the top, I've always loved people, talking with people, um, celebrating with people, sticking up, standing up for people, fighting for people. And so I've definitely had a few mindset changes just growing up, mm -hmm. you know, in North Carolina, in Raleigh being predominantly white, right? But in North Carolina, which is such a diverse state, um, the largest population of Native Americans east of the Mississippi, we have a large population of Black folks with mm -hmm. a rich history going back to, you know, the times of slavery. And so my mindset has changed as I've, I've uh, grown to meet more people. And so in high school, I thought one way, and now being at a student at Chapel Hill, um, helping to lead some of these protests on racial equality, I've really tapped into my Blackness a little bit more and have really tried to understand that side um, of my family history. And mm -hmm. so I, I can just look back. I look back at assignments I did or at writings I did in high school versus now, and things have definitely changed. I think I have a more um, wide worldview and a, a just better understanding. And that understanding will continue to improve and grow um, as to the history associated with Black people here or just anyone non-white in America, right? And so I like to say that I'm interested in politics, I'm majoring in political science, and it's really hard mm -hmm. to detach politics from people because mm -hmm. the root word of politics is P-O-L, and that just means citizens or people. And mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I'm not really into politics or politics doesn't affect me. And that's a level of privilege that they have when they say that. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us that are African-American, we don't have that privilege. Um, and, and so politics affects all of us. And so understanding that the ways that um, we're taught, the ways that we all grow up as people, as well as the decisions that the government makes, um, they really mm -hmm. affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as I continue to understand those, my mindsets definitely continue to change. What specific incident made you aware of racism? That's a great question. I don't know if there was a specific incident that I can remember, mm -hmm. but again, just throughout my life, understanding that people, specifically white people, looked at me um, as being different just because I wasn't white or completely white. Um, I think that kind of wore on me. And so subconsciously, I was always thinking and pondering on that. And then in high mm -hmm. school and in college, as I continued to uh, make friends with people and learn more about my black family history i you know heard about these incidences and would hear about um the ways that folks in the community would talk about people that were not white or would talk about my family or the challenges that my parents had in getting married um mm -hmm. all of those and and of course having me as a result of that all of those things um, contribute to racism and con contribute to this idea excuse me of people just putting um you know, themselves or a certain group of people over another um, because of some made up structure, right? Social structure. And so, um, you know, I've been blessed and privileged in certain ways, right? To mm -hmm. not experience blatant racism often. Um, but I'm mm -hmm. sure throughout my life, as well as throughout my family's life, um, just that idea of people thinking of us as different or thinking of me as different and then not allowing me certain opportunities, that's racism in and of itself. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure as I, you know, continue to grow and um, go into the professional world that racism will continue to occur and that I'll experience that. And so just mentally preparing myself for that and trying to be able to use it when it happens um, as a way of educating instead of getting angry or frustrated, which is so easy to do. And, and often, you know, it makes sense that folks, especially black folks would get angry knowing mm -hmm. the history of this country, but being able to use it as an education tool or an educating tool later in my life is, is what I'm going to strive to do. Mm -hmm. um, you just said a whole lot. That was really good. <laughs> and um, it kind of adds on to the next question, which is who has helped you navigate racism and what is their role in your life? Yeah, another great question. I'm grateful to have a lot of mentors in my life as well as my family. I'm pretty close with my family, even my extended family, and mm -hmm. just the ways in which they've prepared me for life, but also for racism and for the idea that people are going to see me as different mm -hmm. because I'm not white, um, as well as my mentors. You know, I have a diverse set of mentors when it comes to race, when it comes to um, 
you know, gender, when it comes to sexuality and sexual orientation, I should say. And so I think all of that and the intersectionality, right, between race mm. and gender, between race and sexual identity um, really compounds and makes racism greater and, and really weighs on people. And so the ways that they share their life experiences with me, you know, as mm. a way, as preparation to say, get ready because this is coming, um, mm. is going to be so, so important. And I, I do think it's important. And so my mentors, my family members, they share their life experiences regarding racism and then give me the tools and and equip me with the tools to go out and fight it every day. And so I'm grateful for that. And I'm constantly learning from them. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your role in the fight for Black lives? You know, I see my role as an organizer or an mm -hmm. activist, but I like to say that activism isn't something that just happens at a certain point. I think we're mm -hmm. all active and it just comes out at a certain point from us, right? And so for me, it was the Parkland High School school shooting in 2018. Mm -hmm. Uh, down in Florida, I just felt what I like to call righteous anger. I knew something mm -hmm. wasn't right. And I know I knew that students could really make a difference. And I still know that students can make a difference when it comes to gun control. And so I worked with some of my friends and we organized and we became active in the Raleigh community. And we put on an event at my high school. Then we helped stage some of those walkouts that many people remember in 2018 around the nation where students would walk out of class at a certain time and say, you know, this isn't right. We're, we're literally getting killed um, where we're supposed to be getting educated. And so from there, I just really got involved in politics, again, in people in the Raleigh Triangle, North Carolina area, and uh, founded Young Americans Protest and really said, you know, what can I do as a young Black man, as a high school student, to make a difference and to empower young people that are going to come behind me to get involved, mm -hmm. right? How can I tell them and show them how to use their strengths and their gifts to make a difference in their community? And so after the tragic shooting of... Breonna Taylor and the tragic death mm -hmm. of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery down in Georgia mm -hmm. this past year, you know, again, I just felt that righteous anger and I felt like that wasn't right. And so there were mm -hmm. already movements, there were already um, whisperings of action that were going to be taking place in North Carolina starting back in May, so in the mm -hmm. late spring. And so I knew I had to get involved and use the gifts that I had to really get people out and, and take to the streets, to be honest. And so we had a really large scale protest in downtown Raleigh on May 30th. Um, we had protests at city council meetings and um, outside. Of course, in times of COVID, it made it more difficult. And so we had to use yeah. social media, we had to use online to our advantage as organizers. But over the summer, I just got involved and helped lead some of these protests in North Carolina because I knew what was happening just wasn't right. And so I see myself as an organizer, as an activist, and as someone who is able and willing to bring young folks that come behind me into the fight and to say that, you know, this isn't going to end because we get a new president or because we elect yeah. a new governor or because mm -hmm. we get a new city council, but racism is going to be around for a while. And I do believe mm -hmm. it can be defeated um, or at least mitigated, but it's going to take all of us using the gifts that we have to bring yeah. everybody into the fight um, and really speaking out against injustice wherever we see it. Yeah. Okay, so you talked a little bit about the Parkland shooting. What specifically about that situation made you feel like this is enough? Because there has been like other school shootings like Sandy Hook and stuff like this. So what specifically about Parkland um, made you feel empowered? Yeah, you know, you're right. I mean, I can remember growing up and my mom was a teacher. And so going to mm -hmm. her school after my school day and seeing on the TV Sandy Hook or seeing on the TV some of these other shootings that have taken place in American mm -hmm. history. And so I think what was so poignant or so striking about the Parkland school shooting is that it was fellow young people and we could see inside. We saw on social mm -hmm. media that other high schoolers were filming. We could see yeah. the you know, goriness, the blood, the screaming, the scared, the fear that was in these students. And so for high school students who had you know, recently come onto social media to see that, on Snapchat and mm -hmm. Instagram and Twitter and see these students speaking out and crying out, I think that was so powerful to me. And so again, I just felt stirred up. I felt something stir up inside of me and I knew I had to do something, but I knew I couldn't do it on my own. And so that's why we formed a group at my high school to put on the North Carolina Town Hall. Um, that was the event that really sparked the change that I wanted mm -hmm. to see in North Carolina. And so we still haven't done enough here in North Carolina, I don't think when mm -hmm. it comes to gun violence and gun control policies. But I think back to your question, being able to see inside the school as it was taking yep. place and the aftermath mm -hmm. of such a horrific event was really what 
motivated me and a lot of young people to get involved. Right now, the Parkland activists are household names, David Hogg and Emma Gonzalez and March for Our Lives. People know what that is now. And so it's going mm -hmm. to take a continued fight so we don't have to keep having these occurrences of gun violence at school. Mm -hmm. I know you talked a little bit about um, the protest that you, um, well, that you went through and also that you um, hosted. Um, which ones, where, and can you just go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, sure. So the main one was on May 30th, 2020, and that was a protest to stand in solidarity with Minneapolis in the aftermath mm -hmm. of the George Floyd murder and where the officer had his knee, of course, on George's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And so that took place in downtown Raleigh. That was a very spontaneous event. We planned it in less than a week, actually in mm. two days. And we put out social media mm -hmm. flyers. We reached out to our communities. We said, wear a mask, bring hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. And so that was a struggle, even with my own family, because COVID is so prevalent and hits Black yeah. communities so hard for them to allow me to go out there and help lead this. And so I was able to go. We had about 4,000 people that showed out to downtown Raleigh that day, um, that evening. And we really uh, marched around and said, of course, this is another point that I can make a little later, but I don't believe that protest is supposed to be peaceful. It's supposed mm. to be disruptive, but it works mm. best when it is nonviolent. And so mm. we marched around, you know, nonviolently around Raleigh and said, you know, this is the capital city. This is where change can truly take place. We want to see more from our leaders. And so to see people of all backgrounds, you know, young, old, white, black, Latinx, Native American, um, of all sexual identities, just out there saying, you know, this isn't right. And we know this isn't right. We know that people can be doing more. And so we're going to stand up. We're going to use our voice. We're going to literally uh, put our feet where our mouths are and march around until we're heard. It was so powerful. And so after that, for weeks and weeks over the summer, we continued to raise this issue. We continued to protest at the Capitol in downtown Raleigh. We continued to march around downtown Raleigh and continue to give, give news interviews and news conferences. We wrote to our elected leaders and we really said, you know, we're just people, right? We're not part of an organization, but we live in this great state. And part of that greatness is being allowed to protest and being allowed to hear our voices um, heard. And so that was very powerful leading that. And we continue to advocate now. Like I said, with the coronavirus, it's a little more difficult now as the cases are rising to do it in person. And so it's looking like virtual advocacy is a new mm -hmm. term and virtual activism, um, being able to access more people on Zoom or on Facebook and say, we're going to continue having these conversations, but we want to stay safe. And so that's what it looked like over the summer. Um, it was led by young people. I have to say, many of the young people were those that really spurred on the moment and worked with the older generations to learn what were the best tactics. And so, of course, we, we had some of our own ideas as well, but we really wanted to know um, what was going to work in getting the larger North Carolina community to support us. And so that's what it looked like over the summer, and I was glad to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Why do you figure that the protests for Black Lives Matter have increased in the past year? Do you believe the pandemic has any role in the additional support from our allies? That's a great question. I think to answer the first part of it first, I think that the movement for Black Lives has really increased over this past year because people are fed up. And people mm -hmm. have been fed up throughout history, specifically Black people. But I think even white folks and even true allies are taking a stand. I think the Trump administration and the Trump presidency has something to do with it mm -hmm. as well. And just understanding that a lot of racists these past few years have felt emboldened or felt supported by mm -hmm. him and some of his allies. And so I think that it's important that black people um, as well as white people work together in this moment. And I think that's what we did over the summer. Um, we allowed black ideas, black thoughts to be at the forefront, but we had white allies that were willing to put their bodies on the line for mm -hmm. some of the first times in history to support and stand up for us. And so I think that's why social media and of course the pandemic, which I'll get to, also played an important role in just organizing and getting folks out to protest. Mm -hmm. um, I think the important part, just to go off on a tangent for a minute, I like to say that true change takes three pieces, education, mm -hmm. protesting, and policy change. And so I think we're still waiting on that policy change. I think white people have become more educated on the yeah. true history of our nation. You saw this summer and throughout history that the young people have led protests. And so now we're waiting on policy change from our leaders, mm -hmm. right? Many of whom are white or are white men in Congress. And so we're even starting to change that, but that, those policies are really how it's gonna change the lives um, of all Americans and all North Carolinians. And so I think the, to answer the second part of your question now that the pandemic has played a role in it because people have nothing else to do. 
<laughs> um, some people are continuing to work, but over the summer, mm-hmm. folks were fed up and they wanted to use their voices or they wanted to use their bodies. Um, and, you know, restaurants were closed, businesses were closed. And so they said, I want to do one of the few things that I can do, which is protest. Mm-hmm. And so that's what they did. And so that was very powerful um, mm-hmm. to see and, and to understand that, um, of course, folks were still working, but folks were willing to donate their time to standing with us and speaking out against these injustices. Mm-hmm. So you shared a little bit of this piece when you um, talk about the three important things in order to change the dynamic in America, but um, why do you protest and why do you think it, it is an essential element for change? Yeah, I'm going to take the second part of that question first. I think it's an essential element for change because it is so ingrained in the history of this country. You know, something Mm -hmm. that I like to say kind of jokingly, but kind of not when folks were trying to take the protests and make them all about the riots or the break-ins of the businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, The Boston Tea Party was a riot, but it was a bunch of white men, so people didn't want to call it that. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's so important that we understand that from this nation's founding, we always spoke out when we felt something wrong was happening. Yeah. And so protesting, again, not supposed to be peaceful, but it is supposed to be nonviolent. And mm-hmm. for Americans to be able to feel like they can use that voice, getting to the first part of the question, I protest and I believe people should protest because it leads to change, right? Mm-hmm. You can't have that true change without education and you can't have that true change without policy change. You also can't have it without protesting, without gathering people around and raising the issue, making noise, being heard. That's an important part of that true change that I talked about and that's so ingrained in you know, American history. And so for people to, um, you know, when many people are gathered together, they feel supported. And so it'd be mm-hmm. one thing for me to go out on a street corner and shout, you know, in the name of racial justice. But when I have folks of all backgrounds with me, you know, with us saying we're fighting for this idea, we're fighting to be a better nation or a better state or a better community. And one of the ways that we're going to do this is to make people feel uncomfortable to get comfortable in their discomfort. Um, mm-hmm. That's so powerful. And I think that's one of the strengths of protesting. Okay, so um, with the rights and stuff, hmm, hmm, with the rights and stuff, how do, you, um, how do you feel or how do you feel about how people try and, I guess try and make the protest or like um, the nonviolent protest seem as if their violence because of the riots or because you know how riots spark sometimes from the protests and stuff right. and try to make that the main thing that surrounding the whole group you know yeah yeah I do um it's definitely disappointing to me as an organizer mm-hmm. or as someone that's involved in the movement that the news media or other folks would try and detract from the importance of the protests to make them mm-hmm. just about the riots or just about breaking a window mm-hmm. and I mean you've heard it before many people have heard it before in 2020 but windows can be replaced, right? And fixed. Exactly. Lives can't really be replaced. Mm-hmm. And so to keep that idea in the forefront of our minds is so important. Um, we also see in the news reports that many of the riots or many of these antagonizing acts are actually done by white folks or done by mm-hmm. folks that are not leading these um, nonviolent movements. And so mm-hmm. to understand that um, the two are not the same at all and that that doesn't, to me, help with the message of the protesting, but that I think the message of these nonviolent protests is powerful in and of itself. And so to really encourage people to keep the narrative about these protests, about the issues, you know, and not just talk about a broken window because they think it may get more news coverage is important. And so it's definitely disappointing. It was over the summer when folks tried to make it about that, but I just tried to keep the main thing, the main thing and um, continue uh, using people around me and working with people around me to make sure that Folks were getting the story right and we're keeping the focus on these lives, on these communities that were being impacted again by this idea that one group of people is better than another. Okay, with the um, George Floyd shooting in Minneapolis, why do you think um, the whole of America and the whole of the world, they rallied behind that one specific situation, but when it happens in their cities and their state, um, there isn't much noise about it? I think that's a great question. I think one of the uh, differences with the George Floyd incident is that it was such a public murder, right? We could Mm -hmm. all watch for the whole eight minutes, almost nine minutes, as that officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck, you know, and Mm -hmm. as as a human being was dying, um, it was touching and and not in a good way. It was angering. 
And so I think all of America could see that. Now, we've seen other incidences like this throughout history, mm. right, on video and not on video, but by word of mouth, where these, uh, you know, tragic scenarios happen in other parts of the country. And so to your question, why do people, you know, get so riled up or, or so willing to get involved when it's a national incident or event like that, but not necessarily in their own communities? I think, you know, I don't know the answer. I, I would like to hope that when people realize that an injustice has been committed anywhere that they'd get involved. Um, I think that, again, one of the differences is that it was filmed and that it was so widespread and, and seen by so many in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. but we see other incidences like this that don't get such a massive protest turnout. And so going back a few questions, I think that's one of the differences is that so many people had this pent up frustration. And so once the George Floyd incident happened, it was just a catalyst for this protest and for these people to say, you know, that really is enough. Or maybe I didn't get involved in my community where this event happened by a police officer last year, but now I can see people around me um, are angry too. And we want to use that collective anger and frustration for good, for positive change. And so they got involved. I think that's really why um, this George Floyd um, spark was the catalyst that it was. Yeah. Other than protesting, what are other ways that you've advocated for the Black Lives Matter movement? That's a great question. I think just sticking on the COVID topic, um, my friends and I really advocated and talked with the administration at UNC Chapel Hill and the mm -hmm. UNC system um, that really dictates the colleges around the state when it came to COVID reopening mm -hmm. and making sure that these college leaders had their eyes on communities of color because we know that COVID disproportionately affects black and brown communities. And so over the summer at the same time as we were protesting for racial justice when it comes to policing, we were also working as people of color to at sometimes fight with administration and make sure that the necessary precautions were put in place around COVID and COVID-19. So that looked like a lot of Zoom meetings, that looked like a lot of phone calls and just making sure that campuses around the state were as safe as they could be for students to return. And so we saw that, um, or we saw how that didn't really work at UNC Chapel Hill and they're gonna try again in the spring. We see that many HBCUs around the state are actually doing it right and they're testing and their students are wearing masks on the whole and are, are really trying to um, be safe and have that college experience. And so as we continue to progress through these COVID times, that's another area that I'm very passionate about is education and making sure that all students have the opportunities that they need to learn and be safe on school grounds. And so I think that's another way that students and specifically students of color can use their voices is to say, you know, I have a thought or an idea or an opinion. I know how I'm best educated. And so for some of these people that make the decisions about education, they haven't been in education for 20, 30, sometimes 50 years. And so we've really got to be courageous and work with one another to stand up and say, you know, we could be doing this a bit better. And so I also did that over the summer as we were focusing on policing and the ways in which America has really brutalized black people throughout its history. <clears throat> Okay, so last but not least, we finally got the results for the presidential election. After a long week, we were all at the edge of our seat. <laughs> um, how do you think the results of the presidential race will affect the future of the Black Lives Matter movement? I think that is a perfect question to close and kind of culminate all of these discussion points that we've had. Um, yeah. I think it's very historic, firstly, that we have a black woman on the ticket in Kamala Harris. Um, I think it's not so historic that the two options were Joe Biden and Donald Trump, two old white men. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that is just a great launching point for a further discussion on black lives, on the importance of representation, on the importance of having true allies and true allyship in the white community. And so. I tell people I'm cautiously optimistic. I do believe that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will bring a decent administration, a decency mindset, one that puts people above um, politics, right? One that really looks at our shared humanity and, and tries to combat racism, which would be different than these past four years. Um, but I'm also um, cautious, right? And I still want to make sure that policies, again, that policy change is what we're seeing from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, because I believe that America is being educated and that we're protesting, right? We protested against Donald Trump in that we voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I think voting is a form of protest. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's gonna be very important that we continue to apply pressure to, the, to this administration, excuse me, from the top down and making sure that they are 
um, championing policies that are going to advance the um, you know, desires and the needs of the Black community across America. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. I think this is the time. Well, this is not exactly the ah, Lord. This is the time to push for um, the administration we want. This is definitely not the end of our fight. Um, a lot of people think just because Joe has been elected that this is it for us, but we have a long fight ahead of, ahead of us. So, yeah. Thank you so yeah, much for your time. Oh. Uh, no, of course. I was just going to say thank you as well, and that you're right. Um, that's a point that I make often too. It's just because mm -hmm. Joe Biden and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris got into office that yeah. the work and the protesting and the activism and the advocating exactly. it doesn't stop. And so it really needs to be had on the local level in our communities that you talked about with people yeah. speaking up at their city council meetings and town council meetings, because the presidency is very important. But a lot of the decisions that affect Black and Brown people disproportionately. Yeah are made by folks at the local level. So that would just be my last plug or my last mm -hmm. really, you know, just statement because I believe that young people mm -hmm. can really lead the charge, right? If we focus on the local level, if we focus on building each other up instead of tearing each other down. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, maybe someday a young person of color um, can be elected to the highest office in the land as we saw in Barack Obama. Um, mm -hmm. But just understand that representation matters. One of my favorite quotes just wrapping up is you can't be who you can't see. And so we need to see people in positions of true power that look like us or that look like yes. what we want our future to be. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. Of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you.